Hi there, I'm Mike Madge. I'm back with SaleJuice.com. And again, we've got Matt Struble, uh, three times DN world champ. And by his own admission, he's lost track of how many North American championships he's had. That's got to be nice. Uh, back joining with us. Uh, the last session we had him on, we were talking about starting. He gave some really good tips on starting. Uh, a lot of good reviews on, on what went through. And uh, today he's going to jump in uh, the analysis coaching. Uh, he's going to put his coaching hat on and we're going to take a look at uh, a race uh, between two competitors, two opposite competitors on opposite sides of the course. And we're going to get Matt to analyze and coach and and answer some of the questions that you sent in. And thanks for the questions. We'll try and get those answered as best we can. And thanks again, Matt. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, Mike. Uh, happy to be with you here uh, for a second round. Yeah. Hi. Right. So as we talked earlier, we're, we're going to be taking a look at this race here from Sweden. Uh, we'll set it up here. It's uh, two boats. And they're, uh, the two boats, as you'll see here when the video comes up, are, are in the... Uh, the one and two position. So there's the two boats set up in the one, two position. Um, we'll talk maybe Matt, maybe just, just reviewing what we looked at last week uh, with the starts, maybe you as a coach here, let's just take a look and, and see how these guys are set up. Yeah, sounds good. Looks like uh, good conditions, nice blue sky, little breeze, and uh, lots of ice, a uh, touch of snow on it. So yeah, let's let's take a look. Now, in terms of the the how they're set up, like we talked last week, square shoulders, low to the ground, equal pressure on shroud and tiller. Uh, any tips or you'd be given to either of these guys? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, looking at the, the left uh, screen window with the boat on starboard, you know, we have a good side profile there of him. And notice how low his tiller hand is and how high his uh, hand on the shroud is. So I would, uh, my preference would be to get that right hand down a little bit and get them onto the same plane, if you will. But uh, both these guys look like they're squared up pretty good. But just think of it as you, you know, it, like you, when you watch the, bobsled start in the Olympics or something, you need to get your shoulders low and uh, be able to leverage both, you know, the power of both your legs off the, the start. I, you know, in ice boating, it's, you see the end result of a good start, but the reality is a good start really starts right here at the very beginning. So the first three steps are probably the most important part of the ice boat start. And one question that comes up more with people that want to get into ice boating, and, and this is why it's a good video here, is people are amazed that these boats can still go on, on snow. They think they need perfect black ice to go, but obviously that's that's not a truth. Yeah, that's right. It, you know, we typically sail in a couple inches of snow at any time. It, um, you know, anybody who snow skis or does any kind of winter sports understands that you know, there's a big difference between uh, fresh snowfall and relatively warm conditions and snow that's, uh, you know, weak or a couple of weeks old and has gotten compacted down and it's really cold out and it's a higher density. So it's, there's a big variation. And, you know, obviously notice the runners that they're using are plate runners. They're not using the insert runners like we had seen uh, last time or that we would typically use on clear ice. So it's a little bit different configuration set up, but uh, conditions look real nice. Okay, so let's start them off. So we'll get the flag down. As we talked about last week, they're both focused on a flag. So both, if we stop it here, both them entering the, the, the odds similar to what you did last week, you know, I guess you got to be fairly graceful. It's not just a jump into it. Yeah, that's right. And I, I would say, uh, you know, as we saw in this video, as they started to run, both of them, like we talked about with the hand on the shroud, especially was up pretty high. So they were running, you know, kind of stood up. So it's very hard to push against something. You know, you just have poor leverage, obviously. So I would just emphasize, you know, get the shoulders low, uh, hands on the same plane, uh, vertical plane, and, you know, you'll have much more power off the get-go. But then, yeah, here is, is always, uh, you know, the transition from running um, I think you, you saw these guys uh, one foot on the plank with a little kick and now transitioning into the hull. Okay. Main sheet's eased a little bit, looks pretty good. 
And this is really the power up. This is kind of the third phase of the start, if you will, to where you're, you know, you're starting to get the, the power to the ice and into the rig. So it's uh, right away, you can see the boat on the right. Look how much the mast is bent. Uh, both of their bodies are still in a hiking position. So shoulders, head relatively high, which means they're pushing out the back of the boat, you know, for leverage. But notice the boat on the left, pretty straight mast, boat on the right, pretty bent mass. So that third phase of the start, you know, the boat on the right's a little bit further ahead in that transition. Uh, I had a question sent in to me from Tim and uh, he was really impressed with your uh, breaking down of the starting. And the question he had, and he was, he was a pole vaulter in high school like yourself. So he really feels like he's got the speed. He's quite happy with his equipment. Uh, he says he gets running fast, but the problem is after this third stage where you're talking about where you start getting powered up, he gets shot out the back. Um, any suggestions here? Like we're looking at a boat on the left of the screen here early that's getting rolled to windward. Uh, maybe suggestions. Yeah, I mean, uh, with ice boats, they're very dynamic sailing machines. So it's a little bit tough to do it with that little bit of information, honestly. But my uh, intuition would be is, you know, maybe set up a little bit too stiff, perhaps on the plank and the mast. Um, so that would be my first thought. Now, the other thing, uh, just, you know, structurally in the starting process, if you're getting that good of a running start and then getting shot out the back, that means obviously you're not transitioning into that third phase of the start to where you know, you're getting the boat up to sailing speed. So perhaps pinching a little bit, trying to sail too high. Um, you know, if you have a good start, you should be able to put the bow down. And, you know, as my good friend, Ron Sherry always says, uh, err on the side of speed. So it, uh, without looking in more depth into Tim's uh, configuration, um, that would be my recommendation is, you know, err on the side of speed, put the bow down and then, you know, determine, you know, where to go from there. Do you also find sometimes maybe people are trying to get that sheet in too tight too soon? Yeah, you've got to let the boat come to you a bit, you know, from a acceleration standpoint. And it depends on the conditions as well. Um, like these guys are, it looks like pretty fast ice, obviously a little bit of snow, but uh, clearly plenty of breeze. So it, uh, you can get, you know, in, it's kind of like shifting gears in a car, right? It, uh, you can't just go straight from the run push to full pace upwind. You've got to allow it to come to you a little bit. So getting the boat up to speed, a little bit of ishi. That's why I say if Tim's getting a good start, he can put the bow down, let the boat transition into full speed upwind, you know, then he should have a much different result than, um, you know, running fast, getting the boat, and then trying to sail it right to the numbers right at that point. You, you've got to let the boat come to you a little bit. Okay. Hopefully that helps, Tim. Now, one thing we noticed right away, so uh, if we're looking on uh, the left of our screen here, the, the guy on, on, on uh, Port Tack has just rolled over that boat. So is that, a, you know, a lot of us, the average sailors, you know, we're not sailing out in the front, we're dealing with dirty air a lot of time. Would that be a, a good early option or is that his only option or? Well, he's got basically two options. He's got to recognize the boat rolling over the, to windward of him early. And he can either, you know, if he's confident in his boat speed and he, he can go fast, he can put the bow down and essentially try to out drag race this guy or sail high, you know, effectively allow the roll to occur and then flop over to starboard tack and, you know, just go for clean air. So he's, he's got a couple of options, not a lot of time to react to it. The other thing here, I think we could point out, which is quite interesting is straight away. And we talked about it right off the start the boat on the right of screen on starboard tack is clearly has a much softer configuration. So runner plank mass deflection significantly more than the boat on the left on port tack. And you can see, you know, just from a strategic race course management, the guy on the left, he has one mode, right? He's putting the bow down. He's trying to get the, the mass bent, the boat in the groove. Uh, he's really wrestling the boat. It looks like to me, his arms are going to be sore by the end of this race. Uh, the guy on the right, you know, he's a little bit more down in the cockpit, quite a bit of control, and he's sailing above all the boats to leeward of him. 
in comparison to the boat on the left, you know, he's really got the bow down. He's just plowing over the top of the rest of the boats. And I know you talked earlier about aerodynamics. And I mean, uh, I would imagine that's a significant different aerodynamic position to be in. Yeah, that's about worst case on the left side there. Um, you know, you, you figure, you know, sailboats, we have limited uh, energy to go forward. And so one way to get faster is to get rid of aero drag. And you can see his head's up real high, shoulders are out of the cockpit. It's uh, just about worst case scenario there. Ideally, you wanna be tucked right down in the cockpit. You know, I try to get my toes down below the front bulkhead, anything I can do to be down inside the boat. But that really is driven by how the boat is set up. You know, if the boat is a little bit stiff and you're wrestling with it, like on the left side there, you're working really hard. Now, one thing I've had a chance to preview this race, I know you haven't, Matt, which is great for you to jump in and, and, and pick out this stuff so quickly. But the thing that stood out to me fairly quickly here, and I also raced some lasers, and this is a really close windward lured crossing here to me. And uh, I'm just wondering how often this occurs, how comfortable you would be with this. Uh, do you get much one-on-one -on -one type tactical situations where you might be worried of that lured boat luffing you or... Yeah, it's certainly something you want to be aware of as you're going at these kinds of speeds, obviously. But um, for myself, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, the one thing you have to keep in mind in ice boat racing or any high performance sailing these days is time is everything. If, if you're going slow and not in the groove, your competitors are sailing away from you. So uh, this guy, you know, in the, the dark hall on the left, like we had talked about earlier, he has one mode. He's got to put the bow down and really lean on this rig to get it uh, to perform. So he's he's going to have to do this or he's got to tack because if he goes high, the mass is going to go straight and he's going to go slow. So this is his only mode for fast forward. And I guess that's something you got to manage on a course too because people coming off the line, a lot of times are coming off on different angles. So, I mean... You know, I guess that's a that's almost a nightmare for an ice boater to have that boat to leeward of you pinching. Yeah, if you're held up at all, it uh, you know it's it's like all say about racing. Someone dictating your race, you're going to come out on the losing end of that. So, um, in my opinion, the the boat on the left, the dark hull, he's doing the right thing. It's it's his only option is to get the bow down and um, no problem here. It, uh, you know, we're, we're typically not gonna get in a luffing type of uh, strategy with the lured boat. Um, there is some, you know, strategic racing that can occur where maybe you say a little bit of a high line or something to protect your lane, but it, uh, it would have to be done significantly earlier than we're looking at here on the screen now. So I imagine once he gets across this guy's bow, he really wants to put his bow down after this, I would imagine. Yeah, that's right. And I, one thing here that's actually quite uh, interesting, and I, um, it's something that I've done a lot of, is uh, if you're getting rolled, that boat that was rolled on the left side, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the boat that got rolled, he poked his bow up to windward to clear himself into some fresh breeze. So that's, that's a, a pretty good way to counter that. You know, if somebody's rolling you and they're going three, four, five knots faster than you, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to defend. But what you can do if you don't want to tack away or you have no other options, you can poke the, the nose of the boat up into the fresh breeze and uh, you know get back into clean air so it's not such a huge penalty uh, per se so it, it just depends on the situation but this guy did that and it uh, looked like a, a, a pretty good move to me so and, and while we got it stopped here obviously significant difference in the attitude of the two boats here boat on the right uh on starboard tack sitting squat on the ice uh now we got the situation flying a runner with uh, the uh, the port tack boat uh what, what would you think of that? Yeah, this is, that's a great discussion point, actually. And I think something, uh, particularly for newer ice boaters to uh, develop and think about, and it, this is really, you know, dependent on the regatta you're at or the race that you're about to take part in. I typically uh, will do a couple of hot laps before the regatta begins around the race course. And that is 
because going upwind, you can carry a stiffer rig and anybody who's ice boating would know what I'm talking about. You can, you know, uh, shorten the shrouds or pull the rig forward, uh, do some things to stiffen the rig. And upwind, you can live with a stiffer rig uh, in comparison to downwind because we rely on the rig bent out for control because a lot of those load vectors, force vectors are pointed down. Um, we need that downforce downwind. And if the rig is too stiff going downwind, you're just completely out of control. You have no downforce, no riding moment, no leverage. So it uh, is something that you have to test and it's really fine tuning at that point but you have to be careful that you don't just set your boat up for a upwind condition and then you can't get downwind in the regatta in the race. So it's, this is a good example. Clearly the guy on the right, lots of control. He's down in the cockpit, uh, runners, not hiking, um, just lots of, he can sail the boat anywhere. You know, he can put the bow down for speed. He can go a little bit high tactically to clear a boat or obstacle, um, the guy on the left, he has one mode here. He has got to put the bow down. He's got to pull hard on the main sheet. He's got to have that rig bent. It'll be fast. It's got more, more potential to it, but it only has one mode of operation. So if I, I could just ask one question here, like looking at the boat on the, on the left here on, on port, uh, the old theory I thought used to be like you wanted that windward uh, skate a little bit, uh, a little bit light. Uh, is that still, would you be comfortable with that amount of hike uh, while you're going upwind? Yeah, it's, it's a little, that would be more than I would ever want to sail with, to be honest with you. I mean, today with the techniques that we have for aligning runners, um, you know, historically you would fly the windward runner or attempt to, because then you essentially had perfect alignment, right? You had the leeward runner and the steering runner would uh, essentially self-align, but uh, today, the runner alignment is so good, and the windward runner you know, obviously has less loading on it anyway. At this point, I look at it that you're losing riding moment. So I want to go for maximum riding moment, maximum power to the ice, to the rig. And um, so I, in my mind, the guy on the left is set up a fair bit too stiff for my liking. And you can see he's wrestling that boat on the left. See a lot of, a lot of rig moving around, a lot of main sheet trim going on, fair bit of steering. He's getting a workout in, going fast. No question about that, but really working it. All right, so maybe we could pause it here. We got, uh, you know, the boat that, that's going up, if we're looking up, when going up the left side of the course, eventually got to get over to the right side of the course eventually. So here he is tacking, uh, maybe just, uh, before we analyze it uh, tactically, let, let's look at uh, technically. Uh, what, what constitutes a good tack? What are you looking for coming out of the tack? Yeah, it's uh, with ice boats, uh, we talk a lot about the ice conditions and of course, you know, the, the wind speed and things. And you have several different ways to tack or different modes to tack. And let's uh, use clear ice, fast ice and good breeze as an example. I would uh, be aiming for a VMG tack. So if you're going upwind at uh, 40, 45 knots, um, I'm going to look to use all that energy that I've collected. So that is, I'm going to keep the main sheet trimmed in really hard, mass bent, sail flat, and a really slow arc uh, turn up to head to wind. Once I'm up to head to wind and the sail goes through the first, um, you know, flog, if you will, I'm going to then accelerate the turn radius and ease the sheet to come out on the new tack. Um, at the same time, I'm sliding my body forward in the cockpit because this is applying a little bit more weight to the front steering runner, giving me a little bit more control. And it's also allowing me to get down in the cockpit a little bit more so I don't have to let the mainsail out nearly as far. You can see his knees are bent here. That's because he's sliding forward in the cockpit. But then as you come out the, the other side on the new tack, um, a little bit, uh, you know, sharper turn, sheet eased, and then you'll see his leg straighten out into a little bit of a hike, trim the mainsail in, and then again, start to, to bend the rig out and get up to speed. 
And, and in terms of sheet ease, uh, that would vary with uh, the wind conditions. Uh, what, what do we look min-max sheet ease you're looking at? Yeah, you're probably going through a range of about uh, 10 to 12 inches of ease. Um, and of course, some of that naturally occurs as you slide forward, you're holding on to the main sheet. So, you know, the main sheet's going with you to ease. The first turning block is, you know, right by your toes, if you will. And so as you slide forward, naturally, the mainsail gets eased as you go through the eye of the wind. And as you're coming out of your tack, are you getting more into a foot mode for, for a while to build up the, the, the speed again? That's right. Yeah, a little bit of a bear away uh, below you know, your ideal state uh, heading until the rig is bent out. And it's, it's really a big difference around the race course. And I think we'll see it with these two different competitors, uh, given you know, their setup configuration, is the boat on the right gets to that potential quite quickly because the rig's a little bit softer. He can hike, get the rig bent out, slide down in the cockpit, get aero efficient, and then can sail the boat to the numbers. The boat on the left, I suspect we'll see when he goes through the tack, he's going to wrestle with it a little bit. He's going to you know, be playing a little bit more main sheet. He's going to be hiking longer, more aero drag. So just that difference in time, obviously, around a mile, mile and a quarter weather leg, it, it'll make a difference. And I guess the other thing, important note is like, I mean, you really got to have, uh, uh, he's tacking now back onto, uh, onto port tack here. So, I mean, it looks like visibility behind you would be very tricky. So what, what do you do in that situation? Yeah, I like to think of it as uh, quadrants, you know, your um, Rick White, a long time ago, sailing coach, um, you know, told me that, you, you know, good sailors are always, you know, essentially have a picture of the race course and their competitors in their mind. And I, uh, I think that's true that you, you look around at the race course, your competitors where they are, and you have an image of what that looks like. Um, so even if you're looking in a different direction, you have a, a pretty good estimation of, you know, where your competitors are, where the race course is at, and you can make, you know, split second decisions, uh, with value. And, and while we're on the topic of upwind and we'll play this here a little bit further as we're going, uh, one of the questions, particularly for a lot of the newbies and, and even people that have been saying for a while, like, you know, where are you seeing this wind? You know, the snow is not really moving. If you're on bare ice, you, you don't see the wind. Um, how would you answer that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, sort of two part, honestly, is, um, you know, there's the, the lake or the body of water you're sailing on. And so there's the big picture, you know, kind of strategic way of looking at the race course. And that is, you know, the geography, uh, clouds on the land, you know, just, just the base fundamentals, kind of a 30,000 foot view, if you will, at the race course. And then there's, you know, in your cockpit as you're sailing along and uh, a lot of value, a lot of return on a little bit of investment, I think, is as you're doing those couple of laps around the race course, you know, tuning your rig, right? You want to get the right balance between upwind, downwind configuration, make sure you have good control. At that time, you're also feeling out the race course, you know, from a breeze standpoint, it's amazing how consistent the breeze is. And, you know, all ice boaters will recognize this, that it, it repeats. And it's, it's something that I personally carry forward into my summer soft water sailing as well. But, um, you know, the ice boat is very sensitive. You can feel a little, you know, a, a three degree wind shift. You can feel it. it uh, the boat comes alive. And, uh, you know, you're either uh, putting the bow down a little bit or, or coming up or a little bit of hike or whatnot. So it's, it's kind of a, a third dimension of sailing that uh, it's, you know, seat of the pants, I guess they uh, call it in many ways. But it's, you have to be very in tune, have your boat set up, uh, dialed in so that then you can really focus on the race course and little things like wind shifts, pressure, these kinds of things you can then focus on. I guess one question I personally have, and I think like you, you would know from a lot of sailing with, you know, a lot of your senses is involved, especially in soft water. You got sight, you can see the ripples, uh, the pressure on the sheet. Um, do you find hearing becomes more important with ice boating, like listening to the wind whistling over your ear? You have more of a sense of your boat speed. Is that, is that you find that true also or? Yeah, it's actually funny you bring up that topic because even on my moth uh, recently, I've I've tried to sail with a helmet or a couple of different uh, things for safety, but it uh, they've impaired my ability to hear. 
and therefore it, it hurts my ability to sail the boat around the race course. And ice boating is no different. Of course, we're wearing helmets um, and it's very cold. So you, you need to have some protection over your uh, you know, face and ears and things. But uh, sound is definitely plays a part in how the boat is performing and even the conditions around you. And we could see that boat on the right, you know, when he tacked over, he, he got back into fast mode pretty rapidly. It'd be interesting to see this boat on the left go through, through his tack here pretty soon. And again, we can see that, that boat on the left, he's really fighting it. Here we go. Yeah. So head to so win. Head. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Yep, yep. So we can see, you know, again, uh, on the left going through the tack. And, uh, you know, his knees are bent. That's because he's sliding forward in the cockpit, uh, main sheet eased. And now he's getting ready to come out on the new starboard tack. So let's see how he does here. So again, we can see his shoulders, his head, right? Very high out of the boat. So he's, he's really trying to press on it when we're running off the ice. And see, he's going through kind of a, a little bit of a roller coaster ride here, right? He's trimming, he's easing. I guess the other thing I wanted to point out to you, because sometimes I find myself, sometimes you hear stories of, you know, the sheet getting caught around me, it's tangled. It's So I guess it's important to sheet management also, especially when you're working the boat that hard. It is. Yeah. I, I keep the tail end of my main sheet is uh, goes through the forward bulkhead in my boat. And so that it, you know, keeps it from going out the back. Um, so it's good for that. The bad news is if, if you're not careful, it can obviously wrap around your body or, you know, you're moving, you can see these guys are moving quite a bit in the cockpit, you know, hiking in and out. And then of course, tacking, you know, sliding forward and back. So it, uh, you do have to be aware of where the main sheet is, but it, uh, good news is about, you know, high apparent wind, you know, sailing boats like this, you're not using a lot of main sheet, you know, tack or jive is about the, most about a main sheet, you're easing, you know, it's about a foot or so. And uh, once you're sailing upwind, you know, you're playing about, you know, three, four inches of main sheet. So it's, it's not too bad. Now in these conditions here, I, I mean, a lot of high performance boats, uh, I would think at the same time, the tacking uh, DN seems fairly quickly, but I imagine you still get penalized for tacking. So are you trying to minimize your tacking in these conditions? Yeah. I mean, what you'll find in, you know, with uh, any high performance boats is, you know, if the breeze is up and the ice is fast uh, and if there's no penalty to essentially sail the box, you'll see that just occur naturally because of that uh, penalty of tacking. Um, but as the wind lightens up or the ice is a little bit sticky, uh, it, it's fully tactical. So you're, you're trying to play every shift you can. And uh, of course, ice boating, you know, you're looking at the surface of the ice as well. So you're trying to find the smoothest, quickest way around the race course. Now, when we're looking at the guy on the left, he's coming in on starboard here. Like he basically went all the way out to the starboard lay line. Now we're probably talking a, a one mile course. That's a pretty long way to call the, the, the lay line from. What would, what, 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 uh, you know, I'm sure you've been in that situation. What, what are you using to call your lay line? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And this, this goes in alignment with the conversation we were having earlier about, you know, making sure your boat's set up and, uh, you know, checking out the breeze around the race course is those couple of laps before the event, you know, really get your bearing. And it's, you know, the, the tack angles, jibe angles, they really vary, you know, per the condition. So I'm always looking at that as a point of reference, even, even if I'm just in the middle of the course, you know, doing a practice tack or something, I'm looking out the side and I'm using, you know, maybe the tip of the runner or the end of the runner plank, uh, you know, some line of sight gauge so that I can, you know, when I do tack, then I can, I have a reference about, you know, where, where I was before the tack. So it uh, having a visual aid is really important. And I imagine, you know, coming in, uh, the, the guy on the right here, so he, he went off, he went off on starboard tack and then having the advantage of coming in on port, so a little easier to call the lay line for him. Yeah, he'd be a little closer to the weather mark for his final tack on the starboard. Uh, it looks to me, you know, just the way the boats uh, were set up where they're at, the boat on the left, I would suspect is overstood the starboard lay line. 
Uh, now you notice that, you know, his rig's been out pretty good and uh, he's, you know, planted to the ice a little bit better. I, I suspect he's overstood the, the weather mark a bit. And it's like all sailing, you know, it's, it's one boat length, right? You, if you're coming across on port tack, you need one boat length. Yeah, it's amazing. Like you've said that I've heard, you know, even really good laser sailors, you talk about, you know, they're, they're just playing a wave at a time, just trying to inch out, you know, that, you know, inches make difference. So here we go. He's first to the, to the weather mark. Um, uh, what sort of transition would he be making here? He's got to the weather mark. Is there a big transition happening? Yeah, one thing uh, you notice right away, just you know, a couple of seconds before this, is uh, the angle that he's coming to the weather mark. So I think, like you had pointed out, you know, he came across on port tack, so he had a, a really good uh, advantage to judge the starboard ley line into the weather mark. And uh, his angle was, I would call it, relatively steep, if you will into the weather mark. So he was, you know, probably right on the ley line or, or maybe just a fuzz under it. And you can see as he's going around here, he's, um, you know, still a little bit to windward as he goes around. So it, um, you know, now he's got to, got to build speed as he goes downwind here. I, it'll be interesting to see the boat on the left. Cause I think they're slightly overstood. So that angle, I think will be a little bit shallower coming into the weather mark. And it's, you know, that's an area in ice boating, you know, there's, there's several different modes around the weather mark and it's, you've got to keep your options open or understand what your options are. You know, let's say if you understand the weather mark in an ice boat, if the ice is clear, you know, you can sneak it up to windward, you know, 50 meters, uh, 75 meters sometimes, you know, because you're so low drag, but that means as you get to the weather mark, you're going to have to keep it hot to get the boat up to speed for your downwind leg, where if you're overstood, you can uh, come in and you can shoot almost straight down wind right at the weather mark. So there's several different modes around the weather mark and it, uh, it, can, it can mean difference of, you know, three, five boat lengths. Now, I guess the, the other thing that makes it tricky with boats like this, this guy uh, on, the, on the right here, obviously rounded the weather mark first. How, how aware, like you've obviously been in that position numerous times. Uh, how aware are you of how far you're ahead? Yeah, it's it's really tough because the the hardest thing in an ice boat for visibility is straight behind you. So right now, you know, someone could have uh, you know gone around the weather mark right behind you, or you know, it could be a quarter mile behind. So that's it's really hard to judge. Um, you know, in an ice boat soon as you round that weather mark, you're focused forward because you're accelerating uh, very fast. And when you think about it, uh, ice boats are really small projected area. So if uh, particularly by the third lap of a race, if there's boats coming upwind, you can be going head to head and really hard to see a uh, very small frontal area. And it's hard to tell whether they're going the same direction as you or the opposite. So you really have to be focused forward and uh, keeping your eyes out of the boat at this point. This will also be interesting to, to compare the difference. You know, notice the, the boat on the right, you know, we've been talking about how he's a softer rig and that should be a little bit better downwind uh, from a control perspective for sure. So now that the, the boat on the left is, you know, approached and rounding the weather mark it'd be interesting to see how his downwind goes but you can see this angle right away he he was clearly overstood and so he's coming in at a, 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 a quite a shallow angle and going really fast well there you go there's upwind with matt struble uh hopefully we answered a lot of your questions give you some matt give you some good insights on strategy tactics a little bit we had a little two boats set up a little bit different uh, what we got to look forward to is uh, we'll be taking a, a look next week at, at the downwind part. You know, we'll look at some of the strategy, how uh, this, uh, they sit in the boat differently, picking lay lines, jiving. So that'll be the next segment we'll, we'll proceed into in next week. So thanks again, Matt. Appreciate you coming on, on board with us. And I know uh, a lot of people are getting a lot of valuable information from you. So uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can keep you coming back for more. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, always enjoy talking about sailboat racing and uh, no better sailing machine than DN Ice Boats.
Yeah, I'd have to think like with the America's Cup on, a lot of people are commenting, you know, geez, the, the racing almost looks similar. Yeah, I mean, obviously the boat speeds are uh, very close and then the tactics as well. And, you know, any of the errors uh, that occur, uh, guys who uh, race ice boats, it's uh, a lot of that's quite familiar. It, uh, it's happening so quickly that it, uh, it's something, you know, those guys should come out and do a little winter sailing with us for a little tune-up. Great. Okay, well, thanks again, Matt. You enjoy your day and we look forward to talking to you again next week. And uh, we'll be looking at downwind techniques with Matt Struble. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you.